thank you, Lisa. Well, it's, it's, it, we really live in a great place. It's, it's great to see so many interested and engaged uh, folks come out tonight, so thank you very much. Um, I'm excited to tell you about epigenetics, this field we've been working in, and you know, I've been working in for about 15 years now. It's exciting from you know, the fundamentals of, you know, I think of, this is how this string of letters that is our genome, our DNA, is brought to life. Um, it's an exciting field from the science, and I'll talk to you about that. Um, it's an exciting field from the therapeutics, as we've learned that more and more diseases are caused by malfunction of our epigenetic controls, our gene controls, which I'll talk about. And um, as you've probably read, it's an exciting field from the therapeutics and the biotech perspective, as uh, companies around here and throughout the country and world are starting to think about ways to develop drugs that will change the epigenetics of your cells and may uh, be very effective therapeutics going forward. Um, so I came from a medical background, did a pathology residency. Um, but you know, when I saw this field and I, I, I thought about the opportunities that, you know, it's very hard to change DNA sequence, although people are starting to figure out how to do it. Um, there's a lot of opportunity in changing how genes are controlled, and that's what really brought me to this space. Um, I guess in 1999, when I arrived in, in Boston and started my postdoc research, and then in 2005, when I started my group at MGH, and tell you about, I'm going to tell you about the field. Most of the talk's about the field, and then I'll tell you a little bit about our science and where I hope to, to take that. So, I, I, at its heart, you know, the, 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 the mystery here is that you only get one genome. The fertilized egg has this set of DNA, um, set of chromosomes, um, you know, two copies of each chromosome. That's what you get, right? And from that genome, right, you know, there's this development, and ultimately there's an organism, and there's hundreds of cell types, right? Um, yet it's just one genome, and, and each of these cell types has the same DNA, the same genetic information um, at its heart, yet they are so different. And that's really the mystery that we want to talk about um, today. How is that possible? Um, so, you know, definitions and just to generally frame this, you know, very broadly, the field of epigenetics wants to understand um, how our biology, our cells, is determined by how the genome is read, by how the genes are controlled, by the genes' activity. Um, and I would just, you know, contrast that with, with genetics. I mean, we think a lot about genetics. It's been an incredibly productive field. Genetics is a little more focused than on um, DNA sequences changes and these mutations that differ between individuals, right? But I'm going to really focus on um, these gene controls and gene activity and, and, and this piece. And I'll tie it into genetics a little bit, too. But, uh, but that's what I want to do today. Um, some very high-level questions. As I'd like to answer for you at least what we think, you know, how we think this single genome can give rise to so many different cell types. Um, give you a view of what we know about how our genes are controlled. Um, the genome's a big place, and beyond the genes, there's a lot of other sequence information encoded. And we're just starting to learn about that, and that's pretty interesting and pretty informative to all this picture of how genes and cells are controlled. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about diseases and cancer. Um, what are the defects, and, and how might we fix them with uh, therapeutics or other strategies? Um, I have a few scientific controversies along the way. You know, if any field that has uh, excitement, potential, uh, potential therapeutic benefits um, certainly will stir some controversy along the way. Some of you have probably read about this in The New Yorker and other places, but I'll, I'll touch upon that a little bit. So I'll start, try to start simple. You know, the central dogma of biology is that, you know, you have your genes, and your genes are encoded in the DNA sequence, right? And the, you know, those genes, the, the DNA is transcribed to make RNA. And then that RNA is now translated to make the protein. So the proteins are the working pieces, the machinery of the cells that make your cells work. Um, and the genes, the genes in the DNA code for these proteins. We have about 20,000 genes, and I'll talk a little more about that. But there's about 20,000 different genes, uh, protein coding genes. So you have about 20,000 of these in the human genome. Um, 
you know, just some examples to help sort of frame this, you know, genes like uh, myosin that make your muscles contract, right? They make, this is the protein that makes your muscles contract. Hemoglobin that we think about that transports oxygen throughout our blood. Um, the CFTR, this is a transporter that uh, in your lung to transport uh, uh, potassium, and this is, this is what is defective in, in cystic fibrosis. Um, Dopamine receptor, this is in your brain, right? These, this is just some examples of the genes. There's, I could give you a long list, about 20,000, right? Um, so maybe with this information, we can think a little bit about how you could have two different cell types from the same DNA, right? Think about a neuron, and it's, you know, it's pretty different from a blood cell, right? This is sort of, think of some immune cell in your blood. Um, you know, this is just a schematic. Let's say these genes are like light bulbs. Um, in your neuron, there's going to be some set of genes that are on, others that are off. And uh, you might expect there's going to be a neurotransmitter or two that's on in your neuron, right? And it's making protein, right? The other genes aren't making any protein. They're silenced. Um, and this is why, you know, this is a neuron. In contrast, you look at a blood cell, they have the same genes, right? Same genes but they turn off and on different ones, right? Now they're turning off this neurotransmitter, but they're turning on some other gene that is, maybe it's making an antibody that your immune cells need to go around and fight off pathogens, right? So this is sort of the very simple picture here. Um, and actually, this concept is not a, so new. It was actually intuited, uh, I guess, you know, 60 something years ago by Conrad Waddington. This is actually before we really knew about the DNA or pro, you know, how this coded proteins. Um, but Conrad Waddington sort of coined this concept of epigenetic landscape or epigenesis, where Conrad, he reasoned that, well, you know, at the beginning there's a cell. And through the process of development, this cell sitting at the top of some hierarchy will kind of move down these sort of energy, this is sort of an energy minima, or think about a ball rolling down a hill, and um, give rise to the different cell types in an organism. And this turns out to be you know, stunningly accurate for something that was hypothesized in 1949. And you know, this is sort of another picture of that. But now we realize that you know, these cells at the top of Waddington's landscape are these pluripotent stem cells or embryonic stem cells that you know, haven't decided their fate, their, their options are open. Um, these cells, through the process of, of development, and Conrad Waddington called this epigenesis, uh, sort of over development will uh, turn on and off different genes and ultimately sort of fix those states, um, whether they be sort of mesoderm or endoderm, different types of cells, and I kind of show this at the bottom just to tell you, this is the diversity, right? And this is sort of a concept that sort of is, was at the heart of the field of epigenetics as we begin to think about how, you know, again, one genome can give rise to so many different cell types. Um, at this time, we didn't really understand how the genes were coded or we didn't know DNA, but now that we've learned, I'm gonna give you a lot more information as we begin to understand how is this possible that this orchestration of events can proceed. Um, touch on the human genome, right? So what is in our, what is in our genome? This is, uh, this is kind of a fun picture because this is our director, Eric Lander, and Jim Watson there, who's uh, Watson and Crick, of course, who figured out the double helix. And this is Francis Collins, who's the director of the NIH now. And back here's Bob Waterston, who was a visionary in this process and now is in Seattle, published the Human Genome Project in about 2003. So, they sequenced, right, three billion bases. This is what is in the human genome. There's three billion letters of sequence. Um, and with this, you know, you look at this, it's pretty hard to interpret this book. But, um, you know, it wasn't so hard to look for sequences that look like they could code for a protein because there's a special, the, the DNA has these triplets. And you know what the triplets are in the DNA that will lead to certain code for certain amino acids, code for certain types of prints proteins, so you could actually go through this draft of the human genome and you could find the genes. And I, I think people were betting a lot at the time. Eric tells me that there was this whole betting pool where, you know, uh, some people thought there were, you know, 
15,000 genes, but some people thought the humans are so complex because they must have more genes and the, you know, the, the numbers went up. Somebody thought there was 130,000 genes, um, but in the end, the answer was kind of boring. The answer was, in this three billion bases of DNA, there's only about 20,000 protein coding genes. It's not that much more than in a fly or a roundworm. Um, but here was, I think, one of the most striking observations here, and that is that, that those genes, those protein coding genes, account for just one or two percent of the DNA sequence. So, you know, what is the other 99 percent? And, um, you know, to me that was one of the most compelling and interesting questions that, that came out here. Um, you know, people have thought of this as the dark matter or junk DNA, and I'll, I'll, I'll revisit some of these terms as we've evolved our understanding. Um, but this is a really interesting question. If you think about DNA and its purpose is to make a gene that makes a protein, and you realize that only 1% of your genome does that. So um, I'll give you some more information on why that's probably important and how one might intuit that there's something more than the genes. And it comes actually from genetics. So I'm going back to genetics for a little bit. And um, you know, what causes disease? And we know of, uh, you know, here's your, your, your sequence of your genes, and there are diseases caused by mutations in the genes, and there's quite a few of them. Um, they're called, often called monogenic diseases because they're, there is an inheritance pattern. It's pretty simil, simple inheritance or dominant or recessive. Um, one gene's involved. I'll give you some examples. So cystic fibrosis, I already mentioned. It's a mutation in the transporter. Um, and that's what causes cystic fibrosis. fibrosis. There's sickle cell anemia is another example that's a hemoglobin mutation. Uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I could give you a bunch of examples. Not that, there's a, there's a fair number of examples. Um, you know, eye color is kind of a monogenic trait where you, that you inherit in it. And it's one, it's one gene, or it's a little more complicated, but it's not so much more complicated. So this is great, but there's a problem. This is the minority of cases, the vast majority of diseases that are a burden on society that we think about don't fit this, don't fit this uh, simple model. Uh, rather, they're, they're complex. We think of them as complex human diseases. And it's not one mutation, but there are you know, scores or hundreds of different mutations that are somewhat common in the, uh, in the population that if they combine in the wrong ways, and we don't really understand exactly which ways they combine, you end up with disease. And the examples are, you know, diabetes. This is a complex disease. It's not one mutation. There's many that contribute to this. Schizophrenia, multiple sclerosis, cancer. And I could go on and on. And we think of these as, you know, sort of, uh, you might say, polygenic or complex diseases. So that other picture I showed you, where it's just in the gene, that's a little simpler. There's something else going on. Um, oh, and then one other piece I'll tell you is that most of these mutations, they don't even occur in the genes. They occur outside of the genes. They occur in that other 99% that is the dark matter that we don't understand, that we maybe don't think is important or that we're ignoring. But now we realize that most of the mutations that are causing these diseases, were pretty important, um, are occurring outside the genes. Um, and of course, we know that, that understanding these mutations is probably not sufficient to determine whether you're going to get diabetes or some other disease or not. There's this other component, and that's uh, the environment, another piece that we, we don't understand well. And this is kind of at the heart of one piece that I want to talk to you about, about today now. So the, how are genes controlled? Um, and intimately tied to this question is, what else is our genome encoding outside of these genes, right? So let me tell you a little bit about the genome. The genome is, uh, is six feet long. So those three billion chemical letters, I don't know, six feet, right? So you know how big a cell is, right? You, can, you can't see it with the naked eye. It's like you know, a micron, these things are tiny, 100 microns, they're tiny, right? So how, how do you fit six feet of DNA inside of a cell? Well, um, actually you do it a lot like you might fit your sewing thread in, your, in a sewing kit or something like that. It's pretty remarkable. Um, what happens is the DNA is wrapped around spools. And the spools are made of protein. And you take a couple hundred bases of DNA, you just wrap it around a spool. And then the next 200 is wrapped around the next spool. And then there's the next spool. And if you think about it, there's millions of spools. But these spools are all organized and sort of tightly packed. And they get into higher ordered structures and very carefully organized. So you know, every cell in your body, you've got 
you know, billions of cells, every cell in your body has the whole genome in it, and that's six feet, and the whole thing's packaged in a way to fit, right? And if you think about it, not only does it have to fit, but it has to be read. You, know, you have to be able to read the genes and make the RNA and make your proteins, right? So how does this work? So I told you there are these spools. And what's really interesting, the spools, as I'll show you in a sec, well, the spools can open and close. I'll show you that. And I'm going to also show you that, that spools can be tagged with little chemicals that, that, that sort of file them away in appropriate places. So this one, this spool, you better keep it open. Uh, this spool has got some DNA you'll never need, so just really shut it off. And how does that work? Um, so here's a picture of these sort of spools. The DNA is wrapped around it. They're called nucleosomes, but it's not so important to think about that. I think of them as spools. And you know, in a cell where you don't need a gene, you think of an example. In a neuron, you don't need hemoglobin, right? You're never going to need it. Never, ever need hemoglobin in a neuron. So you would take the gene, the DNA that's the hemoglobin gene, and it just gets wrapped up real tight like this. It's totally shut down and compacted, sequestered away. You're never going to use it. So this is how a gene is kind of kept off, right? But that neuron needs the neurotransmitter. So that neurotransmitter DNA is wrapped in a very different way. The nucleosomes are loosened up, and there's a lot of intervening DNA between those spools. And it's opened up in a way that now, remember I told you they make RNA, which makes protein. There's this transcription machinery that makes the RNA. You can get right in there, because the DNA is, you know, the, the gene is opened up, right? So this is kind of what, you know, it's called chromatin. This is your genome packaging. This is, you know, not only do you have to fit six feet into a cell, but you have to appropriately open and close genes at, at the right times, right? So I mentioned there were chemical tags that help you file this away. And here's, again, the same kind of picture with the DNA wrapped around these spools. The spools in the DNA actually get methyl groups placed on them, different kinds of chemical modifications. And these methyl groups serve as tags. There's some methyl groups that you put at one place, and it says, keep this shut off and tight and compact. You're never going to use it. There's some methyl groups that kind of uh, open it up and say, this is a region that should be opened. Um, and you know, there's other methyl groups that, well, I'll show you some more examples of you know, uh, how you might tag things in different ways. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, signposts in here, so there's a lot of different kind of tags that you could put down, which is really exciting, right? And not surprisingly, has been controversial. So um, there's been talk of an epigenetic code. If you think about it, there's all these signposts and there's these tags, and you could put different tags at different places, and you can label DNA for open or for closed or for turn on later or uh, for other functions. So um, this has led to this idea that maybe this is a code. We know there's a genetic code, and that's how what I just showed you, the genes each code for a different protein. Might there be an epigenetic code uh, sitting on top of that, another layer of regulation? It's a beautiful concept. It's very powerful. Um, you know, the idea, do chemical tags create some kind of an epigenetic code where combinations of these, these marks do um, and there, I don't know, maybe some of you saw in the New Yorker, certainly my field was very interested in this when the this, there's this uh, article by Sid Mukherjee about how you know epigenetics and nature and nurture, and he was writing about his aunts, his aunties who were twins, but had somehow had very different life experiences and were so different. And he thought this must relate to epigenetics. And um, it was an interesting article. Uh, he went pretty far and sort of just in the article he said, well, there's an epigenetic code, and this code must do this, and you know, there's really big implications for biology and medicine if there's an epigenetic code, and there's implications for therapeutics, and there's some pretty serious scientists in the world. And I'm only giving you, I think, one or two examples. But, <laughs> but, but, but scientists take their science very seriously. This is another Cambridgean here uh, at Harvard. He's done wonderful work in DNA sequencing. Didn't seem to like the article. This is so wildly wrong that it defies rational analysis. Um, yeah, this is another Nobel laureate at Yale, I guess. It is unfortunate to inflict this article on the audience of the New Yorker. Um, and you know, I'm a big fan of epigenetics. I love this field. But at a certain level, these guys were right in some ways. Um, 
And actually, the, 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 the truth of it is a little complicated, but Steve Hennikoff, who's a good colleague of ours in Seattle, kind of wrote this. And he, he said, Mukherjee seemed not to realize that you know, transcription factors occupy this, this top of the hierarchy of epigenetic information. And there are chemical tags, but the chemical tags enforce the programs specified by the transcription factor. So what they're saying, what, what this article wrote about is, is solely talked about the tags as the only entity. But you know, this whole thing I showed you with the uh, Waddington's landscape, there are other factors and genes that help specify what, as an embryonic stem cell, when it becomes a skin cell or a nerve cell, there are all these factors that specify this um, beyond the tags. There are proteins, they're called factors or transcription factors. Um, and really then these tags come in and they kind of keep, once that's specified, they keep the status quo, right? And so this has sort of been the controversy in the field. Epigenetic code's probably a little bit of an overreach. It's a complex system. Cells specify themselves and then they kind of get locked in in certain ways. Um, anyways, people took it very seriously. They got kind of, they got a little over the top. So I, I just wanted to mention this. Um, you know, these are important. I'm going to talk about them. But I also thought it's valuable to, to convey that there's a lot of things in the cell that are interacting. There's a lot of complexity that, you know, as you might guess, to take a pluripotent stem cell and create all the different pieces of the body. Um, this, paper, this is interesting to read, but um, the science in it was a little bit uh, superficial and, and, and I guess a bit flawed. I'll have a couple more of these to, to share with you later. But um, with that said, um, you know, it may be that there are factors that set a gene as on or set a gene as off or maybe make a gene poised. But what's really interesting is as that happens, the tags do go there. And when those chemical tags are going there, we can sequence them, we can study them, and we can see which genes have which kinds of tags. So we can learn a lot about the state of a gene. We can simply you know, scan the genome for tags. And we can you know, do this in you know, a, a, a neuron or a blood cell or whatever, and we can see all the genes that are active because they're, um, they're nucleosomes. These spools are tagged in a particular way and opened up. So you know, we can quickly see, ah, here's a set of genes that are active and open in, in the neurons. And here's a set of genes that are active and open in hepatocytes, here's, in, in liver. Here's a set. And we can, we can do this. We can go through. Um, and one interesting thing is there's other genes that are silent by because you can tell there's a chemical group that helps sh keep them shut off. There's other genes that are in these poised states. And there's another pattern where we say these genes are off, but it's really interesting because we see this in stem cells a lot. These are genes that are off now, but they can come on later. They're poised, right? And you think about it, embryonic stem cells, they don't have all their genes on, but if they can form any different cell type, they better have them all poised. They better have the ability to turn them on at some later date. And there's this, the information content in these tags is really extraordinary. There's more too. Um, this is the genes, but, but there's other things too. And, and, there are other kinds of tags on these spools that are associated with switches. And I'm going to talk about switches, but this is really interesting. Sometimes they're called enhancers. These are sitting around, and they help turn genes on and off. So I'm going to talk about this a little bit. It's really interesting. Um, and there are others that are boundaries. And I'll come up to boundaries so that, that sort of partition your genome into different little functional units. And um, you can. Um, do sc genome scans. Here's just a chromosome, a chromosome, a chromosome um, human chromosome, and, and you can, you can. There's techniques we can scan across the genome, and we can read out all the places where you've got this tag or something like that, right? So, we can very rapidly proceed through um, through genomes and understand how they're used and and when they're used. Um, this brings me actually to the Encode project. I've been involved for a long time in a project called Encode, which is one of these. You know, there's the Human Genome Project was completed. You had the sequence, but as I showed you, you just knew the genes, right? But, but what else is there, right? And, and the ENCODE Project was sort of launched with the concept that, you know, how are we going to learn about the other pieces of the genome? And actually, by scanning the genome. And when you do that, you see, well, certainly the genes. And, but we kind of knew where these were anyway, because there's a characteristic sequence code we can find. But it turns out there's these other switches I mentioned. They, we, can, we, can't, we can't 
we can't look at the DNA sequence and intuit when it, where a switch is because we don't understand the rules. But when we do a genome scan for some of these tags, it's very easy to see them because they're these sites and that's where the tags are in the genome. And we can find boundary elements and so on. And ENCODE published this in 2012. Um, and they published a Google map for the human genome was sort of the, the title of the New York Times article. So this was exciting. Um, and here's where it led us, right? I showed you these switches. So these are all my light bulbs. These are the genes, right? Um, but as we proceeded through ENCODE, we mapped all the switches. There's about a million switches. So there's 20,000 genes, yet they are controlled by an extraordinary number of other sequences. The sequences don't code for protein. What they do is they have codes to turn on or off nearby genes. And they do that in a cell type specific manner. So why are genes on in, you know, why is your neurotransmitter on in, in, a, in a brain? Because there's a code, there's a sequence nearby at a switch that has the coded information in the sequence to tell that neurotransmitter, to activate that neurotransmitter just in the neuron, just in the right cell type. And that's sort of this, you know, this picture here where there's a lot of switches. And that was a bit of an epiphany in 2012. Um, but it also, as you know, with most scientific discoveries, it launched another controversy um, about junk DNA. I'll take just a moment to think, talk about it. It's kind of just such a cool concept of that is, there, is your genome full of junk? And people have thought that for a long time. And there's probably a lot of junk in your genome. Um, you know, genome size comparisons are interesting. Uh, you know, how many bases are in a virus? You know, viruses can't replicate on their own. They need some help, right? They invade cells. They don't need much DNA, 170,000 bases. Bacteria, maybe they have five million, although they can have less or more. Bases, this is how many bases of DNA. Fruit fly, a complex, there's different cell types. It's a metazoan, multicellular organization, organism, 130 million. Humans are three billion, and normally I thought we'd stop here, but they, they don't win because uh, there's these canopy plants that have, have you know, way more. And I kind of like this, but, but <laughs> the, onion, the onion's got, you know, it's got like 50 times more DNA than, than, than a human does, right? So maybe this will lead you towards the side that maybe not all of the DNA in the genome is functional important. Um, some of it, certainly in the onion, some of this stuff must be unimportant or you would see something more special. Uh, and they'd be able to talk. Um, so junk DNA. Francis Crick, actually, this has been kind of noticed for a while that that your genes are sort of floating in a sea of gibberish DNA sequence that just doesn't mean anything to you. And Francis Crick kind of, he said, the rest is a little better than junk. And when Francis Crick of Watson Crick says something, he uses the term junk, you know, people remember it, right? So there's this junk DNA concept that most of your genome is junk. And so this is interesting. So in the, when the ENCODE had a bunch of papers proclaiming that they'd made the Google map of the human genome, the NIH released a press release that got us into, frankly, a little bit of trouble. So it said, the, the press release said, during the early debates about the human genome projects, researchers predicted that only a few percent of the human genome encoded proteins, I told you this, right, and that the rest was junk. And then the NIH said, we now know that this conclusion was wrong. So this got some people in the community very upset, and I'll tell you why. So Ford Doolittle sort of a, He's kind of a legendary evolutionary biologist who kind of just sort of thinks about sequence and evolution. And there's a principle, if you study mutational rates between different organisms um, and you know how similar humans are to like a, some primate or to a mouse or, you know, and you look at the divergence of the DNA, you can learn things about how frequent mutations happen between generations and that's kind of, there's a mutational burden. And if you make some calculations, which I couldn't do here for you, but evolutionary biologists do this for you, they can actually calculate that at its upper limit, only 10% of the genome could be under selection. That is, to them, function means that from generation to generation, these, this particular base stays the same. And if it changes, you got a problem, right? You have a mutation, it's deleterious. So, so they've studied this, only 10% of the human genome can be under purifying selection, or to them that means functional. So to them, to Ford Doolittle, the upper limit was 10%. He's, to him, you know, even if there's a lot more beyond the genes, it can't be more than 10%, there's still 90% where 
you know, this junk. And if you can argue with him, maybe he'll give you 20%. But that's the most he's going to give you. So this statement from actually, of all places, the Human Genome Institute at the NIH got people very upset. And um, you know, the junk DNA was junk, de dead and that the whole genome is functional because it really, from evolutionary principle, it can't all be functional or we would collapse as a species. There's a solution, though. I mean, it's actually, if you kind of just think through it, there's a lot of back and forth and it got pretty nasty and negative, but there's a pretty simple solution. There's, you know, is this junk or not, right? This is a bunch of dirt and there's these diamonds sort of, and it's hard to see, but there's diamonds all through this. And, you know, outside of the genes, there's these vast stretches of what we'd call junk. And within those vast stretches, there are these little switches here and here and here. And it may be that, you know, in this vast stretch, only 10% of it or less of, is, is really functional. It's these switches. But you can't just dismiss it as junk. You better go through it and try to figure out who's important and who's functional. I'll tell you why. Remember I showed you that in those diseases like diabetes and schizophrenia, that the mutations were sitting outside of the DNA, outside of the genes? It turns out if you line them up, if you line up those mutations associated with these complex diseases and this Google map of where all the switches are, the mutations are sitting in the switches. So these mutations that kind of, in small bits, contribute risk to schizophrenia, diabetes, you know, all these diseases, um, those mutations are sitting in switches and what they are doing, although we don't understand exactly how, is, can, is, is, is deregulating gene activity. They're not changing the sequence of the gene, but they're putting it up a little bit or they're turning it down a little bit and they're increasing our risk of getting disease and, you know, ultimately we'd love to know how that combines with environmental exposures and gene controls. To, to lead to disease. So that's a big piece of what we're trying to do in this field. As long as you, you seem to like controversy, so I have one more for you. And then I'm going to tell you about some of our, our um, I'm going to look and see what time it is, but good. We're, I think we're good. Um, another controversy is this business of transgenerational inheritance. This is a little bit of a non sequitur, but I, I would be remiss not to mention it because I'm sure a lot of people kind of Think about epigenetics, genetics, can you transmit this? And we hear all these things about your child or the, the mother or the pregnant mother or the grandchild having some influence from their, um, you know, what happened to their grandparents. And, you know, there's some evidence, some really interesting evidence. It's the Dutch famine cohort. During World War II, there's, there's the, the famine um, during the blockade in, in, in um, Holland. And, you can actually look at the second generation, the grandkids, and the grandkids of par whose parents were in utero during the Dutch famine actually have a higher risk of getting diabetes and certain other diseases. So somehow this famine had an effect generations down the road. It's a subtle effect, but statistically there's something going on there. And it's not, this is inconceivable, but this is causing a change in the DNA sequence. So something is transmitted. You can do mouse models too. The effect is subtle. You have to give them a really high fat, a really awful diet. But if you give them a really awful diet so they can hardly bear it, you can see that the next generation, and even the, the following generation, has some metabolic deregulation. Some effect is transmitted. Um, People get upset by this sometimes, and I'll show you why. I mean, this is goes back to Lamarck and Darwin, where, whereas you know you think Lamarck said that you know <coughs> giraffes get their necks get longer because they keep using their necks to reach the trees, right? And this is Lamarckian, you know, you know, use and disuse, and this is how you get from here to here. Of course, um, you know, we know that's wrong, and we know that the Darwin is right. That really, what happened is the taller there's a variation in the taller giraffes survive better than, than these other guys, you know, are selected away. They, they didn't do well, right? Um, we know that this is, you know, 99.9%, .9%, right? And people have basically dismissed, dismissed Lamarck. But it's interesting, you know, if there is some way to transmit some information about your experience through a couple generations, you know, I'm not going to say Lamarck was right at all, but I would say there's, there may be just an inkling of, you know, maybe a father can transmit just a little bit of information to a child that, hey, things are rough, the, there's, the food is scarce right now, you better be thrifty. And the field is starting to understand ways that possibly through um, 
you know, sperm or you know, other, other ways that some of this information could be transmitted a little bit. I don't want to give you the idea that, that that's a big piece of the puzzle. 99% of the story is that all of your epigenetic memory is erased and forgotten when you, in, in a sperm or the egg. It's all forgotten. It's erased. All the methyl marks, I showed you those tags, they're, er they're erased and they're reset. Everything's reset. Genetics is what's inherited and there's natural selection. That said, you'll read a little bit and you know, people get excited about that. There, there's, there's these intriguing glimpses whereby some of this information um, may be transmitted at least by a generation or so. So what do I do here? I got a last five, five, 10 minutes I just want to tell you. We have a great group of sort of trainees, scientists, physician scientists, and technologists. Um, I spend time here at the Broad. We have a group at the Broad. We have a group at MGH, where, you know, right next to the hospital where we're studying disease. Here where we have access to sort of the greatest technologies, um, I think, in the world. And it's sort of having the synergy of being able to study the genome, the genome's tags, how genes are controlled with these, you know, latest generation of devices, um, and having, you know, at the same time working with surgeons and clinicians who are treating patients, studying their tumors and samples. Um, that's what I'm so excited about being here. And I have a great group of colleagues around me that, that contribute immensely to this. Um, and I'll just, t I'll leave you with a few minutes on what we think about cancer and just a couple things that we've learned. Um, you know, people think about cancer genetics, cancer as a genetic disease where um, you get mutations and the mutations happen in genes and they either turn a gene on or they turn a gene off. And this is sort of the cancer genetics model. But hopefully I've now convinced you that there are epigenetic ways to turn a gene on with a little tag or to shut a gene off and silence it with, with a different tag. And this, we're learning, is a big piece of the puzzle in cancer. And I'll just give you two examples. We think a lot about brain tumors, uh, gliomas. And I'll give you an example of an epigenetic change that can drive, cause brain tumors. And then I'll give you an example of why epigenetics can lead to drug resistance and a real problem we need to think about in the clinic. In glioma, there's a particular type of glioma. It's called lower grade gliomas. Um, and there's a mutation in, in a metabolic gene, but that's not really important for the topic here. Um, what happens is that the DNA gets hypermethylated. There's just way too many methyl groups on the DNA, and they can't be removed. For a long time, people thought this might be shutting off genes, but actually it's doing something, I think, quite a bit more interesting, and I'll show you that. Um, these little blue stripes are just sequences of just the DNA, right? And if you look at a chromosome, we're now learning that the DNA is partitioned into loops, lots of different loops. And um, the loops are insulated separate neighborhoods. I told you about the enhancer switches. Here's an enhancer switch. This enhancer switch can turn on the gene, green here, the gene, in the same loop that's nearby. So that's, it can turn on the gene. But it can't touch this gene that's in the neighboring loop because they're insulated neighborhoods. They're separated. And there are these anchors that keep them as they are. What we actually learned in glioma, when you get glioma, you methylate these anchors and you break the loops. The loops open up. And now enhancers like this can start turning on genes nearby. You didn't change anybody's sequence, but you refolded this. So now this guy can turn on this guy. Why would that matter? Well. We, it, it, one particular genome refold turns on a cancer gene, cancer-causing gene. Here's just a cancer-causing gene. It's insulated in its own neighborhood. There's a switch that would normally want to turn it on, but it can't in normal cells because they're in separate loops and they're in separate neighborhoods. But it turns out in this brain tumor, this anchor here gets methylated and it falls apart. And now this loop refolds and this switch turns on PDGFRA, which is an oncogene, cancer-causing gene, leading to glioma. And this is interesting for a couple of reasons. One is we'd love to develop diagnostics so we can detect that, so we can understand that's going on in patients. But also, you know, there's demethylating agents. This can be drugged, right? Mutations, it's pretty hard to drug mutations, especially in cancer. But you might be able to drug something like a refolding with agents that change methylation. So the second example I want to give is in glioblastoma. It's a related type of brain tumor that's very, very aggressive. Um, this is a picture of glioblastoma cells. 
stained to see which ones turn on which gene, which transcription factor. And I guess the only, there's two things I want you to see. One is that it's very heterogeneous. Different cells, they're all brain tumor cells in the brain tumor, but they turn on different genes and they're pretty heterogeneous in terms of which genes they have on and off. It's a heterogeneous tumor. There are some special cells within them called cancer stem cells we're very interested in because they are the ones that drive and replenish the tumor. Um, these cells sort of proliferate in response to oncogenes. And you know, I don't give you much of the data, but in the lab we showed that actually, although these cells are proliferative and you can treat them with a drug that kills proliferating cells, um, some cells persist and survive. We call them persisters. So these are brain tumor cancer cells that should respond to this drug, but they don't and they persist. And what we've learned is that these cancer stem cells can variegate or switch back and forth between two states. So there's no genetic change. This is an epigenetic change. The reason this switch is happening is they're turning on and off different genes. They're plastic. They're able to switch between their states. Here's a proliferative state and here's a persister state. The proliferative state is dependent on these sort of kinases, the oncogenes. But this guy's acting very differently. It's growing very slowly and it seems very plastic in terms of ability to turn on and off genes. Why do we care? Well, how do you treat cancer? You treat cancer with drugs that kill proliferating cells, cells that are dividing, right? So you treat a brain tumor with chemotherapy, radiation, or, or even some of these new targeted therapies we're very excited about. You're going to get this, this cell, right? But this group of cells that's in this slow cycling persister state are going to keep growing, even under the pressure of chemotherapy. And we're afraid that they're going to start evolving, changing their sequence and doing all sorts of other things in ways that make the tumor much worse, right? So I would just sort of leave you that we're now learning that there are other kinds of drugs, particularly epigenetic drugs that, that, that throw kinks in the gene controls. And by throwing kinks in the gene controls, we think we may be able to add on to this something that hits this. And, and this is kind of a direction that we're really pursuing in brain tumors. Um, and more broadly, I'll leave you with this very last slide that's sort of where you know, my labs and our group here is, is thinking a lot. And that is, you know, the field has made a lot of progress in teasing out these fundamental mechanisms of how genes come on and off. Where are the switches? And I showed you an inkling of that, but the field's learned quite a bit, you know. Um, the field is now beginning to see again and again examples in brain tumors and leukemias and many other uh, common non-cancer diseases where these epigenetic mechanisms are going awry, right? And this is about where we are. So, you know, you can imagine that we need to now bring this into the clinic and develop new diagnostic tools. We need to team up better with these companies starting now with, with, with drugs that go in and tinker with the controls, with the gene controls. Um, and, you know, by, by bringing these sort of, I guess, separate islands together um, through very, you know, collaborative groups of scientists who have expertise that spans from these technologies and computational science and basic basic epigenetics uh, to, to the clinical and translational and therapeutics, you can imagine it's a lot, of, a lot of diverse expertise is needed. But that's what I'm excited about this field. We finally seem to have an inkling of what's going on here. And we're seeing it's important in the disease, but I'm hoping we close the loop in the next five or 10 years and can have some real impact. That's it, thank you. So Brad, can we start with a question from our Twitter audience? Um, the question is, if you could answer any question in your field of epigenetics, what would it be? <laughs> what are the really compelling questions? We, th there's, there are these long, there's a lot of parts. There's a lot of parts in the gene controls. We know about 100 different proteins and genes whose job it is actually to control those gene controls. Um, and we've got ways of inhibiting them with drugs. Um, and then over here we've got these diseases where we know that the gene controls have gone wrong. But we haven't yet figured out how to connect the dots between the two because if we could figure out in disease X that, gene, that the controls were wrong because of you know, this particular protein, 
we could then think about therapeutic strategies to go after this protein, maybe correct gene X. But right now, there's this real disconnect between um, you know, what are the defects in gene controls and how we, how we could fix them. We know there's drugs, but, but how do you, when do you use them? Where do you use them? How do you use them? And that's the piece that I would like to try to solve. So uh, maybe I missed it, but could you explain how, in this model, how the environment works epigenetically? Because obviously there are environmental causes or f of different kinds of cancers. There's initiators, so that, yeah, et cetera. So, that, that's a great so how does it? How does the environment come into activating point. these epigenetic factors? The answer is we we don't know yet. The answer is we don't know yet. I give you, I'll give you examples of how this might work. The, the machinery that turns genes on and off is sensitive to levels of metabolites, um, to stresses a cell is experiencing, and they, they, they change how they control genes. They sense environment, and they change how genes are controlled. So I could give you examples that if you starved an organism, these, the machinery will behave differently and it'll turn genes on and off in different ways. So um, the problem is, and I can give you, you know, we're studying these kinds of mechanisms in the lab. There's a big disconnect in the field, and I, it may disappoint you. The disconnect in the field is that um, we have not been able to link in a really scientifically rigorous way you know, toxins and environmental exposures in the environment, in our community, we don't know how to link that in a scientifically rigorous way to a physical change in a gene control. We've got epidemiological evidence that for sure, you know, environmental exposures have an influence on physiology, on disease risk. But we, the field has not progressed to the point where we can layer upon that mechanism. We need to layer upon that mechanism. We don't need to know exactly how this metabolite or toxin or you know, folate, folate is doing that. And, and the field has simply not been able to do that. There are some models that, will, that, that, is, that are progressing. Um, and I can give you, you know, concepts while we're regulating the machinery. How are you regulating mach the machines that turn things on? We don't quite know yet. And, and, and you know, we hope we get there, but I don't want to overpromise because. Well, what about this huge There's another example where you're, it's another good question. I mean, you're, you are acquiring some mutations over time. Part of that's genetic. Cells divide. Um, cancers take a very long time to arise. Each time a cell divides, a little bit happens. There's a little bit of plasticity. A little <laughs> defects are introduced. Um, a cancer is not one event. There are multiple hits along the way, and they accumulate over a long period of time. Um, and I'll just point out, you know, we have a lot of mouse models for cancer. But when we study a mouse that gets cancer, we give it cancer, and it gets cancer in three months. That may not be the best way to model a human cancer that, as you just pointed, rightly pointed out, probably may have taken 20, 30 years to evolve. So. Um, these are hard things to study in the laboratory, right? We like to do our experiments in a couple days, a week, maybe a few months, maybe a year. But how do you follow, you know, really follow a, a, a combination of mutations and environmental exposures and whatever over a long period of time? You know, we're working on it. Ultimately, I think the field will be there, but we've got a ways to go. That's a good question. Talk, talk, talk a little. So mitochondrial DNA, there's, it's a small genome. Yeah. So the, the point is there's mitochondria. In addition to our genome, there are mitochondrial genes, mitochondrial genome that's inherited a little differently through maternal inheritance. Um, 
it's, it's actually entirely, they're, they're not organized in the same way. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't tell you this, but, but that those, those spools I showed you, bacteria don't have them and they don't need them. Their genome's small. And they just sort of let the DNA wrap up as it will. What happened is when you went to, from prokaryotes to eukaryotes, and all of a sudden your genome got much bigger, then those spools were evolutionarily introduced. So yeast have them, right? Um, mitochondrial DNA looks a little more bacterial in its nature, and it doesn't have these same spools. We don't really know how, I know very little. I think the field knows very little about how those how those genes are regulated. And there's some very good people here, Bamsi Mutha for one, who's, who's studying exactly that. But uh, it's a good question. Yeah. So you talked about how it's likely you're like ninety nine percent likely connected you get reset or lost. Yes. There's certainly a lot of papers. <laughs> there have been a lot of papers. People have, you know, with the ability, I showed you those scans. With the ability to scan the, the tags, there have been people running through the, the, the Dutch cohort. They actually had the samples from the individual in the Dutch cohorts. It's got to be a tag that, that tells you who's going to get, you know, the diabetes and why. Um, there are mouse models, and people are scanning them. Um, people are studying, you know, the cells, the gametes, as they divide and form the germ cells and the, you know, um, and it's, there's just nothing yet has come out of any tags. There's some recent work that is really interesting, and that is that there may be, there may be signals sent um, during sperm development from the seminiferous tubules that put in these tRNAs that regulate uh, trend, these repetitive junk pieces of our DNA in funny ways to help control um, some metabolic genes. And this is some very recent work from Ali Rando. Uh, he actually spoke here very recently. Um, that's some of the most compelling stuff I've seen later, lately. Um, if you think about it, it's likely that these kind of effects are going to occur through methylation, through tags, on some of the junk repetitive sequences in our DNA. And by doing that, we might miss that it needs to be reset. But there's genes nearby, and you might affect a gene nearby. So, you know, it's very speculative. I, I don't think anybody's figured it out yet. Yeah. So Is it, are we going to see what? Something that controls the switches. Mm, switches. Right. Well, this goes back to the caveat in one of the controversies. So what controls the switches? And what controls the switches are those, trans, those factors. Remember Steve Hedekoff, after all the complaining and that, the, the ta that those tags were not enough, that somebody else is setting the stage, it's the factors. They're called transcription factors. And each cell type has different ones. And the different transcription factors turn on just the right switches for that cell type. Now, it's a little bit complicated because the switches, in turn, go back and turn on the transcription factors. So there's sort of a feed forward loop. But you know, I could have gone on more about the switches. Upstream of the switches are proteins that turn on those switches that recognize the sequence code of those, se those switches and turn them on in just the right cell. And they form these reinforcing loops that help maintain the switches, maintain the genes, and maintain the cell types. It's these factors that Steve Hennikoff in the quote was sort of uh, mentioning. And that, it's very important. I noticed that the Um, <laughs> there are some very interesting epigenetic differences between men and women. Um, you know, I am very dedicated to training young women scientists, and I'm one of my missions in life is to see uh, some spectacular women faculty come out of my lab. My mother was a professor in psychology, and this is an issue that's very uh, close to my heart. Um, the, the field is a male-dominated field. But I think that can be addressed by you know, great trainees. And I'm, I'm, I'm 
trying to do my part. <laughs> <laughs> this is a simple question. I was, you know, the Dutch uh, uh, the study. Dutch famine. I know that most of these studies have been on mice, but it would be more interesting if there were more on humans. Yeah. Uh, have there been other ones? That one's famous, but ha have there been other ones? Thank you. Uh, there have been plenty of famines. There have been a lot of devastating famines. In, no, no, but, but, but there's a really, I think there's an interesting answer to your question. There have been a lot of famines. I mean, you know, Africa and other things. I think what was so interesting and extraordinary about the Dutch famine is there was literally a blockade and there was no food. Yet all of these women who were pregnant were going to their doctors regularly and there were very careful exams and checkups and they knew exactly what their, what their trimesters and due dates and you know, they had detailed medical records like a first world country like we have today, yet there was no food and they were starving. That is what is so exceptional about that particular cohort. There are some others, too, that, that, that people have been studying. Um, there's a lot of really interesting epidemiology, you know, studying different cohorts and communities that have been, you know, had very different uh, environments and sociologic stat status and so on. Um, that's why that one's so special and has taken so much interest, and there's enormous numbers of samples and yet, as I, I, I think I answered somebody else here, you know, the scans have just not turned up anything. There's no question that there's, there's medical outcomes, that, that there, there's increased rates of a whole litany of diseases. But the scans to try to find, again, the mechanism have turned up short, which is, you know, why maybe the mouse models are pretty important. Maybe we identify a mechanism in mouse. Maybe with that information, we can go back to the human cohort and look for something more specifically and have the power to detect the dyes. 